Sometimes with a tune that good, sometimes you just got to let it roll. Welcome in to the Fantasy Footballers DFS podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Morganoni. As always, with Matthew, I'm looking pretty fly right now, Bets. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. Um, nothing nothing out of ordinary for me. I, this is one of those sweats days, you know. Shout out to my wife. Uh, giving me a hard time for this, but, you know, it's I'm trying to be comfortable. This is coming out on a Friday. You know, we got that weekend feel, so... Yeah, we're we're feeling comfy heading into one more week, dude, before the uh, the NFL draft. I'm psyched. Yes, NFL draft is upon us. We're going to be talking NFL draft scenarios. Last week we talked about our mock draft, and we're going to give a couple of different scenarios where if this happens with this player, here's what you can expect for fantasy. Here's what we're going to be talking about with DFS for the betting world. So, yeah, I think it's time for us to move beyond just here's our convictions. We've hopefully placed our wagers. We're at a point now where we're all in, right? Like, I'm not really trying to empty the bank account anymore. My wife won't let me. I've already done as much as I could with Sauce Gardner. Jamison Williams is still our boy and probably will be our boy uh, for years to come if our top 10 or top 5 bets hit. But, yeah, are you at the point now with the NFL draft where, like, all right, I'm going to take a little break. I know you just placed a lot of USFL wagers, but take a little little break here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's always tough because we usually say that there's an edge earlier things come out. So now that more information is coming out and that these draft props have been available for a few months, it's harder to find an edge as you get closer to the NFL draft. I will say, however, there are times where the market sort of overcorrects itself. So I'll probably be looking for a couple spots and maybe pick and choose over the next week to see if there's anything that pops up. But yeah, I think in large part, um, now we've kind of just let the chips fall where they may and hope for the best at this point. Yeah, depending on which book you use, we obviously talk about DK Sportsbook a lot here. You can actually find that they give out free bets, uh, free risk-free ones. Um, so those are the ones right now where I'm like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to keep betting the same things. I am going to have, if I have a hunch, use some of those. So it's at the point of the season where I, I just don't find that you're going to be able to find the plus, you know, five thousand odds anymore. Same thing with Jamison Williams, like we've talked about. Like if it hits, it hits. Uh, If it doesn't, then that's totally fine. I wanted to just kind of give a quick question. This one's from Steve from the website from Raleigh. I like Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a good good spot. Steve asked this. How do you distinguish between a good bet, as in like this is a good line that the book put out, and ones to actually bet? So what's the distinguishing factors for you and uh, any specific things that made you pounce on a certain team for win totals? Well, I think in general just the most simplest form of of what do you kind of picture as a good bet or what's a good line is like when you log in you look at it and all of a sudden you just kind of stop and think to yourself like huh i really don't know like i could see this going either way clearly that's a, a good line and you know you don't have to bet all of these especially for win totals so um when i log in and i see a bet that i'm like i just really don't know um stay away i mean it's a great line as far as picking off uh, bad lines or things that I think are bettable, I mean, in general, I'm usually looking for unders when possible, especially when you're looking on a season-long bet. So we're going to talk probably at some point, Kyle, like season-long player props, so how many receiving yards, rushing yards, those sort of things, or in this case, win totals. We're looking for unders because you're basically embracing the fact that there's a lot of ways things can go wrong in the NFL. It is extremely variant from season to season. Uh, even week to week in the NFL. And so I'm looking for where can things go wrong and where do I think a line is maybe too high. The perfect example is the Bears, who we've talked about at under seven. When that came out, you and I both were like, does that seem off to you? And we both said, yep, let's go for it right away. So looking for situations where you can kind of find and pick those uh, those lines that are too high is a good play to go in. And I will say ones that I usually stay away from are just like the best teams in football. Right. Their win totals are so hard. Like, you're not going to take an under on the Bills, right? Like, they're one of the best teams in football. They're the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl. But at the same time, 
betting on them to go over, you're just expecting everything to go right, which certainly could happen, but is not a place where I want to lose my money. So yeah, I'm looking for unders and um, and staying away from those lines that I think are pretty efficient. The Bills are a great example. Right now they're at 11 and a half on DK, also on FanDuel. That's a great line. Obviously, they're not going to end at 11 and a half. There is a correct answer here of the under or the over, but when you look at their schedule, when you look at their just the team that they're Super Bowl favorites, 12 wins in a 17-game season seems very doable. The under, I think, there's a lot of scenarios where things could go wrong with the first place schedule, with, you know, God forbid, an injury to Josh Allen, something like that. There are scenarios, and that's why we talk a lot about unders. There's more routes to that actually happening when you have a win total that high. But I, I look at that line and I go, that's a really good line. I'm going to bet the Bills elsewhere than try to mess around with their win total because I think it's a great spot. For me, and maybe you could add in this too, you have to take your, I have to take my Falcons cap off. I have to take my fantasy hat off when I look at win totals because there's certain players I like, there's certain teams that I'm all about. I could see both sides for so many different teams if I'm looking at this from an analytical standpoint and not just a fan. So, you know, I look at some of these teams that have win totals like uh, the Colts, nine and a half. Nine and a half, nine's not a ton. They have a new quarterback. There's lots of things that, that could change there. Who are the other wide receivers other than Michael Pittman? There's there's lots of different things. But when I look at that line, I go, that's a really good line because I think Matt Ryan is significantly better than Carson Wentz. And it puts them in a position where, yeah, they could win the division. I think they are actually division favorites right now. So you look at those and you actually ha- – when you pause for a little bit, you say to yourself, what could go wrong – what could go right, that's when you feel like you're right in the middle. I feel like that's the that's the hardest thing because usually we want to say, ooh, here's where I could see things go right and we take the over. But why do you think things going wrong with the under is actually a smarter way to look at this? Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, when you look at like trying to hit on overs in general, the only real one that we've taken is the Ravens right now that we've been pretty, you know, we're all in. We think that's a, a bad line. And it's because you also look to it like kind of historically, where is the market year over year? And that's a place that we could kind of quote unquote buy low on that. Whereas, you know, these win totals get propped up, especially year over year, because it's not rocket science. They take the best teams and they give them the highest win totals and say, you know, this is what we think is going to happen. It's why the Falcons are at the bottom and the Bills are at the top. It's not really that hard to kind of figure out where it comes from. But yeah, looking for... Um, cherry picking unders, I think it makes a lot of sense because of, like you said, you know, things go wrong, injuries, suspensions, uh, player roles aren't as what we, as good as we thought they could be or coaching changes or things like that. So yeah, I think in general, the big take home here is, you know, we're looking for unders and we're hopefully finding edges in that market versus trying to go over on a lot of these teams. I'll give you a team that you can totally talk me out of this. I've already put some money down. It's the over on the Washington commanders with Carson Wentz. Their win totals at 7.5 in my initial schedule projections. I had them at 8.25. So whenever I look at that and I say there's a significant, you know, 0.75 or a win difference, I usually look at those as ones that I want to bet. And Warren Sharp tweeted out that this is the easiest projected schedule in the NFL. And that actually is significant. There's a lot of stickiness to Warren Sharp's projections of strength of schedule with stats. And I just asked myself, what could go wrong here? And honestly, like Carson Wentz could just be trash. They could be one of the worst teams in the league. I still think they can get five wins out of that. Like, I think that they're in a division that's very easy. They play the AFC South and NFC North, two easier divisions. They have some very winnable road games. Like, listen to some of these road games that are supposed to be tough. The Bears, the Lions, the Texans. Like, those are three teams that I'm like. said they were supposed to be tough. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. It should be tough. But these are winnable games on the road. And obviously, the NFC East could be a mediocre division as is. So I just think that there's enough ways where they could get over. But I'm not saying when I look at this line saying it's a smash, I just think the line's lower than I think. So talk me out of the commanders. I mean, I I think I agree with you. Like, if you're going to take a side, that's probably the side that makes the most sense. Also, last year, like... The Bengals were a team no one thought was going to be good. They were at six and a half, I believe. I took some over on that, not because I thought they could go to the Super Bowl. Truthfully, I did not think that was in the range of outcomes. Apparently it was. 
Um, but because that line just felt low enough that, you know, this team doesn't have to do that much to win last year for the Bengals, seven, seven wins for, uh, Washington, eight wins is very much in the range of outcomes, especially when you look at the quarterback play they had last year. And yes, Carson Wentz, there's so many holes you can poke in that situation, but I think is an upgrade over Taylor Heineke, or at least on the same playing field. Um, and then, yeah, you know, they lose uh, Chase Young to the injury. They have Ron Rivera now in another year with that coaching staff. They also have uh, a couple of ways that they can kind of improve in the draft. They pick, hold the 11th pick. So, you know, there's a bunch of ways they can go. We also haven't even talked about Curtis Samuel in over an entire calendar year because he barely played last year. So you kind of are getting another player, another weapon into the offense. So, yeah, I think seven and a half probably is a little low. I think I saw another market, another book. I saw it at eight. So like it kind of seems like it's on the move up to eight. Well, if it gets to eight or eight and a half for me, that would definitely be a stay away. But I do think there's a little value on seven and a half for sure to go over. Yeah, on FanDuel, they opened up at eight and a half. So that, w- that was a big telling sign for me. Like, okay, here's two big books. One of them's seven and a half. One's eight and a half. That's a pretty significant difference. A half win, I can see huge. that. So I took the over on, on DK Sportsbook. They were a seven and 10 team this past year, by the way. So, uh, you know, whenever people say like things could only get better, I always say like they could actually get worse. They could actually stay the same. It's totally possible. So yeah, I just think that's a good good example. But yeah, when you get these lines... There's gut involved, there's metrics involved, all of those things, but take your fan hat off, see, you know, what's there, see what kind of juice there is. Is it, you know, minus 170, whatever it is, is it, or is it minus 110? So you can look at that. We have some of our win total content that's going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks as teams shape out after the draft. You can follow bets on social media at the fantasy PT. I believe you're also on the gram. I'm not. You, you throwing out some pictures of you and your dog? That's pretty much all my Instagram uh, consists of at this point. Yes, is my dog. Occasionally a football post, and in six ish weeks, probably my my kids. So, so yes, that's, follow me over there too. If that's you what want you're more, getting, right? Uh, that... If you want more dad life content, yeah, that's the kind of content that people want. You won't find anything from me on Instagram, not there, but at Kyle underscore Borg on Twitter. We can chat. Uh, I'm hopefully not too mean, but. Let's talk about the NFL draft and some upcoming scenarios. Hey, rookie. Welcome to the NFL. This is about us giving our takes, some scenarios with the draft that could that could be beneficial for fantasy or betting. So we're not saying this is what's going to happen. We're just giving a couple of different players, a couple of different teams that we would say, hey, they have this opportunity coming up with a draft, and if things shake out correctly, then here's here's how you could benefit, or here's what we could see. So I'll start us off, and feel free if you want to jump in and say, hey, I think that's too strong of a take. I could see that in the realm of, of possibilities. I'm going to talk about Chris Olave. Okay, wide receiver out of Ohio State. Feels like he's been there forever. Uh, he could have come out the year before. Here's the scenario that I want to give. Chris Olave, to me, is not a team's wide receiver one in the NFL. He doesn't have the size. I think he's going to fit in super well as a wide receiver two for a team, but field stretcher, but he can also do way more than that. I want to give a scenario if he's drafted at 12 by the Vikings or by the Saints at 16. Now, I've actually seen him mock there a bunch with the Saints, but the Vikings at 12 is not a team that I think has he's been placed there because you think Adam Thielen, think Justin Jefferson, oh, they don't need a wide receiver. Thielen could be gone after this year. Like contract-wise, I think it's it's totally possible. So I'd love it if they could add a player like that. And if he goes to a team like the Saints or the Vikings, I think that he can become the wide receiver one for fantasy in this class in year one. What do you think? At this point, with all these wide receivers who are projected to go in the first round, which as the days go by, seems like more and more of them are going in, in round one. I, I love Alave. I mean, he's got the route running for sure. And you think about uh, how that translates to the NFL level, you know, that is going to help the team and going to help elevate his quarterback's play for sure. And when I think you look at these two teams, you know, Kirk Cousins, they, they kind of seem like they're they're not giving him these huge long term deals, but they keep going with Kirk Cousins. Like Kirk's a very serviceable serviceable quarterback for fantasy, obviously. 
and for supporting his wide receivers, as we've seen with Adam Thielen, Justin Jefferson, obviously. Then you look at Jameis Winston, like there's a massive, massive opportunity across from Michael Thomas, assuming Michael Thomas is still Michael Thomas in New Orleans, and we don't really know. But yes, that team definitely needs wide receiver, and I could see these two landing spots absolutely being possible. Um, Can he be the wide receiver one in this class? I think so. I don't think he has high of a ceiling as someone like maybe a Jamison Williams for sure. um, or a Garrett Wilson personally. But if we looked back in two years and he was the wide receiver one in Dynasty from this class, would not be shocked at all. I think what's also interesting about Al- Alave is I think he's the most NFL ready, in my opinion, because as weird as it is, like whoever's drafted first in these wide receivers, Garrett Wilson, Jameson Williams, Drake London, whoever is drafted first, you know, hopefully in the first top 10 picks, usually goes first in dynasty drafts or is drafted first in redraft. But it doesn't mean that their situation is necessarily the best for fantasy. Right now, Olave is the wide receiver 49 in underdog best ball ADP. So I think that's totally fine where he's going, but he is going behind the big names. Let's say that Garrett Wilson ends up on the Jets or he ends up on the Falcons. He might be getting volume, but the quarterback play between Marcus Mariota and Zach Wilson is very different than what he would get from Cousins. And I'm not saying that that's always going to translate to you need to go to this wide receiver too for fantasy. I just think that with his strengths as a route runner, he can win at all three levels of the field. He's not just a deep ball guy, although when you look at Ohio State highlights, you see this guy getting behind defenses. And he has the body control that I like. I The way that I comped him earlier is... He's got a little Golden Tate in his game. I think he's refined the way that Calvin Ridley was. I think he's faster than Calvin Ridley. And he's taller than Brandon Cook. So he's kind of got like all three of those players together where like Golden Tate was super tough, where he would like actually like go deep but actually make catches in the air. Calvin Ridley is just a refined route runner. He's not that fast though. And then Brandon Cooks just makes plays down the field but he's not that tall. I think Olave is a little bit taller. So that's kind of my comp. And if you get him as a wide receiver too, I think he can contribute right away. So with that, do you feel like people should be lower in year one on players like Drake London, Traylon Burks, that to me, I think year one, I think it's going to take him a second. Same thing with Jameson. Like who knows how many games he's going to play in year one. Yeah, that's the tricky conversation is like, how do you look at this stuff from a redraft perspective and week to week in DFS versus, you know, your dynasty formats where you don't care as much. It matters for sure. but you don't care as much about landing spot and and production right out of the gate. You know, with Jameson Williams, I think everyone knows your best football that you're going to get from him is not this season. Most likely, of course, players come back from different at different rates from injury and things like that. But on paper, it looks like it's going to be more likely that 2023 is the year for Williams. So yeah, if you're talking about how these guys look in terms of like best ball ADP or redraft leagues, like Alave has a chance to not necessarily be the best wide receiver in five years, but certainly be the best like the next two, three years or something like that. So yeah, there's so much that goes into it. I actually, I agree with your take, Kyle. I love the comps, by the way. I think that's a perfect description of this player. Um, I'm excited. I, As an Eagles fan, I really hope he's there with one of our picks because I like Alave's game a lot. His over-under right now is 17 and a half. If you had to guess where he's going to go, maybe not specific team, but would you take the over or the under? I would take the under. In our mock last week, I mocked him at 11 to Washington. I think there's a range where he could be there at that pick, obviously, if I if I put him there. I think that's possible. And then, of course, you know, there's teams that are picking kind of in that uh, 13 to 17 range that he would definitely be a fit for. So especially the Saints, like you said, at 16, I think makes sense. So personally, I lean the under, but I think it's a pretty good line on it, obviously. Yeah, I think it's a good line too. But yeah, I would I would agree. I think that one of those teams, he's he's just set up. So yeah, if it's the Eagles, if it's the Saints, if it's the Vikings, I know that's kind of a wilder team. Those are playoff teams. Like those are teams that we think will be have good enough offenses. So Chris Olave, a name that I think a lot of people love, but I just think, what if he's the wide receiver one for fantasy this year? And DFS, I think we're going to be talking about him. Yep, I agree. I also want to talk about another wide receiver in this class. And this guy, I feel like, is kind of flying under the radar for fantasy purposes, which is why I wanted to bring him up. It's George Pickens, the wide receiver out of Georgia. Now, if you rewind the tape a couple of years ago, as a freshman, this dude at Georgia walks on the field, puts up over 700 yards, eight touchdowns in the SEC as a true freshman. 
Then it was kind of a lackluster year with quarterback play in 2020. Obviously, that was the COVID year. Then this past spring, tears his ACL, only plays in a handful of games for Georgia. And obviously, we don't have it much on him as far as tape from this year or production. So when you look at his production profile, it doesn't look good because there's not a lot of numbers to support this player. But there's been a ton of steam on Pickens in early round two or potentially pushing up into the first round. Last I saw, I think a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, he was in the like the plus 300, plus 400 range to go in round one. That is slowly creeping up into the plus 200 range. So the betting market seems to be telling us that it's more likely than not as of two weeks ago compared to this week that he will probably sneak into the back of the first round. And then you look at how that supports his draft profile, you know, draft capital matters for sure. So if he gets that round one selection and the teams that he's mocked to, it would be so tricky for us in fantasy to decipher this player because you have the injury history, the lack of production. But if he lands with a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes, how do you evaluate him in fantasy or in rookie drafts especially? So he's a player that I'm really kind of torn on, but you can't ignore that landing spot if he would go there. So what are your thoughts on Pickens? Any value that you see right now, like his current best ball ADP is in the 60s. I think it's 68 for wide receiver and on underdog. So he's a guy that definitely is, you talk about him all the time, is after kind of the big five in this class. I'm a little biased. I saw a lot of him at Georgia. But yeah, you're right. The line's moved in a way. Right now, top 32, I just checked it. He's at plus 150. So he's oh, moved wow. from being you know over 300 to now. He's close. I think it wouldn't shock me to see if he switched spots with Christian Watson, who's at minus 110. You know, he's right in that range with Jahan Dotson, Sky Moore, like fringe wide res- fringe first round guys. And it's kind of just dependent on which team likes who. Like, it wouldn't shock me if any of those guys. I also think we need to realize with fantasy, the injuries that we think plague teams, because we don't really want to use these players, same thing with Jameson Williams, NFL teams do not think that way. They're not thinking about 2022 in your fantasy draft. They're thinking about who this player is. And in terms of breakout age, in terms of who he is, like, he has all the tools. My comps for him on the high end, is Devonte Parker, like someone who's big, fast, tall, can win down the field. And I think there's more to his game. You've seen with Parker as he's kind of progressed, like, okay, this is not just a, a freak athlete. This guy can actually just win. I mean, he used to put Stefan Gilmore to school in those games. So my low end though, I don't know if you like this. My low end comp is Chris Conley. Oh, Chris Conley. <laughs> Didn't he also go to Georgia? He did. I know I'm cheating a little bit there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I I don't like that comp because he's not <laughs> he's not good. <laughs> this also brings back lots of nightmares of me playing him on like showdown slates on Thursday night when he was with the Jaguars, Chris Conley, uh, which spoiler alert did not go well. But um, but as far as his game and how he profiles, I kind of like the Devonte Parker comp. I also could see like he kind of has that Kenny Galladay type of game, you know, where he's not necessarily a huge separator, but like certainly can win at the catch point and has enough, uh, you know in his game where he can create a little bit of separation to go up and get the football. So yeah, he's a tricky guy to, to evaluate because the analytics tell you the production profile is lacking, but at the same time, you know that he's, he's good. You don't go to, into the sec to Georgia and produce that way as a freshman, unless you're good at football. And, and you know, that's the reality. We just haven't seen it a lot because of the injury. So if he lands in round one, if he lands on the chiefs or the Packers, there's a range of outcomes where he's, the wide receiver three wide receiver two in this class something like that if it all goes right but the market certainly doesn't think that that's the way it should be just because of the fact that these other guys we know for sure are definitely going around one and i'm not saying that i disagree with that i just think that there's a, a higher ceiling than pickens on pickens i should say than some of these other guys like a dotson or uh, you know these guys kind of going after him like the high round two guys all right well i'm gonna put you on the spot because i so i didn't i didn't know this i just got a notification that says hey you have 10 minutes left to take your pick an underdog and I need to take a wide oh, receiver <laughs> and I'm going to give you some names because George Pickens is there right ahead of him in terms of rookies. David Bell's going ahead of him. Uh, so he's, he's there wide receiver 68 currently in the ADP. So I'll give you some names and you tell me if I should take him cause I'm on the clock and I have six minutes left. So here we go. Would you rather have Josh Palmer, Jarvis Landry, LaVisca Chenault, no way. Uh, Curtis Samuel, <laughs> aforementioned. Julio Jones without a team, sad day. Russell Gage or George Pickens? 
I think I lean Russell Gage, who with the Bucks should see targets out of the slot and should be a near every down player, assuming this year they run the three wide receiver set like they did last year. So I think I lean there. Certainly would take him over guys like Julio and Jarvis Landry, who also don't have a landing spot right now. Right. Um, and I think the NFL is telling us what they think of those players at this point of their career, given the market has been virtually nothing for them. So, yeah, I think I lean Pickens, though, behind um, Russell Gage. I actually did need some stability to this. I have a pretty boom-bust wide receiver core. Your boy, Big Mike. Big Mike Williams. Got T. Higgins on that bunch. Michael Gallup, who knows when he's going to come back. Chris Olave. Uh, so, but, of course, I have George Kittle on the team. I mean, isn't you just log in every 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 draft you do, you get George Kittle. Even if you have to take him in the first round, you just do it because you have to get him. I mean, if he slides to like the fifth round, which is where I got him, I oh wow, I love it. I love it so much that I know my bank account was emptied because of this man last year. <laughs> but fool me once, right? That's insane, though. I mean the the opportunity cost for the fifth round for a player like that versus the second round, which is where it was last right. year completely different conversation so yeah in round five i'm all about it before we get into our next draft scenarios let's take a quick break i want to hit you with the draft scenario that a couple of weeks ago we actually kind of mentioned and i think you and i were in step about this and here's what i want to say the new york giants everyone's favorite team four and 13 last year the Giants have a chance with their first two picks to become the class of the NFC East. <laughs> thoughts? I mean, if you want my honest thoughts about what just popped into my head when you were talking, was the play of them running a quarterback sneak <laughs> inside their own five-yard Jake line. Jake Fromm? Just to be able to punt. And and the fact that that is not there anymore as far as Jason Garrett is a terrible coordinator. Joe Judge was not a good head Joe coach. Joe Judge is the worst. The fact that that is not there is a win in and of itself if you change nothing else with this team. So they were a five I mean, team. truthfully, right. And we talk about it. You know, you mentioned the stat like these teams picking in the top 10. There's someone that turns it around so quick year over year that if you're picking one, like to me, it is the Giants. And it's not because I think they're going to win the Super Bowl. It's because... They have those two picks. Like you said, it's a relatively weak division. There's holes you can poke in the Eagles, in the in the, the Manders. You know, we've seen the Cowboys fumble away an opportunity or two or three or four over the last five years. So, yeah, man, I don't think it's crazy. I mean, a lot has to go right, you know, with the first-year head coach. But I'll let you go ahead and take it from here because I don't think this is an egregious take. First, the first I want to mention how detrimental Joe Judge was for this team because – Yes, they were four and thirteen. Do you know what their line is right now for the win total? How many wins? I feel like I should know this based off how often I log in. No. But I'm gonna guess I'm gonna guess six wins. Six and a half. It's seven. It's seven right okay. now, which was a little more than what I thought too. I think it's Vegas also saying, Hey, this team is way better than what they were doing last year. So they were only three I think and they three were and six and a half last year, weren't they? Do you right. remember? Yeah. And the under hit. They were only three and oh, three. Did it ever. <laughs> <laughs> three and three in one score games this past year. Why do you ask? Because they were blown out in 10 of them, like completely blown out, including their final six where it wasn't close at all. Remember, like at the end of the year, it was basically just play your defense against the Giants because they were throwing out our boy Mike Glennon or Jake Fromm. So knowing what the Giants were last year, right now they're plus 650 to win the NFC East and they're at seven wins. It's minus 110 on both sides. I have actually taken a stance on both of those. Now, the NFC East is kind of a long shot, but I think with seven wins, it's kind of like our Falcons bet last year. You can get a push if you get to seven wins. Their schedule is quite enticing as a fourth-place schedule, okay? I mean, listen to some of these home games. The Panthers, the Bears, the Lions, the Texans. And that's not even talking about in-division games. Which, you know, it's, it's It wouldn't shock me if those divisional games... If everyone just went, you know, three and three and just split them like that's That's just kind of how it usually works. And they also have some other winnable games. So I think seven wins is totally in play. What they need is just replacement level play from Daniel Jones. All right. Last year, Tom Brady led the league, according to PFF war 
with 4.18 wins. Derek Carr was right in the middle at 2.77. Jimmy Garoppolo was near the bottom at 1.39. All right. If they could just get one and a half wins out of Daniel Daniel Jones, something he's actually never done, I think that you're just looking for something that's just replacement level and you're looking for him to get a TD rate above 3%, which he hasn't done the last two years. That's atrocious, people. I think that with their wide receivers, they have enough there and hopefully they'll contribute more than five touchdowns, which is what they had last year combined. That ranked dead last in the league despite them having the most salary in the NFL. So here's what here's what I'm saying. I think the Giants have a recipe of schedule. They don't have Joe Judge or Dave Gettleman. That's a or Jason Garrett. That's it. That's a big addition. Big plus. Big, <laughs> they need they have a schedule. They need Daniel Jones to be a replacement level. I think their weapons are totally fine. And with their first two picks, okay, you and I mocked them uh, with either a tackle uh, or Sauce Gardner at pick seven. I think that offensive tackle or edge rusher, which they could so- certainly do, or quarterback are all positions that, that can, they can contribute year one. And this team needs them to contribute now because this is their window with Daniel Jones. All right, They're going to move on after this year if, if the things don't work out. So I think there's a window with the Giants where at least they can get to seven wins. I think it's not crazy for them to win the division. I think at plus 650, I don't think you can find another team on the board with that type of odds where you think, hey, they could win. Yeah, I, I don't hate this take at all. I think that's a great call as far as, like you said, we kind of not know, but we kind of know that they're going to take two players that are going to contribute, at least in some fashion, in the top 10, which you cannot say about other players, not necessarily. You know, let's say, for example, Malik Willis. It's not likely, but we've kind of been against the the movement of him going at number two overall. Let's say he does. Like, does he really contribute to the Lions that much in year one? Probably not. Maybe, but probably not. You know, same thing with Kenny Pickett. Like, rookie quarterbacks are tough when you go into situations where things are just bad all around them, which is what those situations mostly are. So looking at this, I think that makes sense that they go, like you said, corner, tackle, something like that. And then you look at the team next year, and they're in a pretty decent spot already year two with uh, their head coach and Brian Dable. If it isn't Daniel Jones, they're in position again to kind of go in and then maybe take a rookie quarterback. So I think the arrow is largely pointing up for the Giants, which is something we haven't been able to say for a long time. And that's that's really what this comes down to. So I do think that they're a little undervalued as far as the likelihood to win the division, likelihood to go over their win total. You know, they could certainly be a team that goes nine and eight and no one would be surprised at all. Their defense was actually way better than I remembered this past year, not just in terms of end of season stat categories, but uh, it wasn't. It wasn't their defense's issue. I mean, it was having the worst offense in the league. That that was their biggest problem. So, I think that they can get healthy, get some production out of their wide receivers. I mean, I get it. Kenny Galladay's kind of a joke right now, but you get replacement level play from him. You have Sterling Shepard, Kadarius Tony. Like there are weapons on this team that they're in a good spot. I just curious, like if they get an edge rusher, like if Thibodeau or Trayvon Walker somehow drops to five, I think that's just gold for them and gold for their defense. So I, I just I like their chances in the NFC East way more than I would have thought. Never been a Giants fan. And I think this is a spot where at least the market I think is lower than it should be on them. Yep. I definitely agree. Another team that is really interesting to me to kind of think about what they're gonna do in the first round is the Saints. And I know that they're a team that people kind of have linked to Kenny Pickett if he falls. Maybe they go up and get a Malik Willis if they like him. There's a lot of rumors about, you know, well, they traded with the Eagles to get a second first round pick this year. Maybe they're trying to package those two and go up. There's also been reports from reporters from The Athletic kind of saying like, yeah, they're not really, that's not their plan. If it works out, great, but it's not their plan. So I just want to see what happens with this team if they take two win now pieces, just like you're saying with the Giants. They've got Jameis Winston coming back, small sample size, but in seven games last year where he started, they were five and two. Pretty dang good. You'll you'll take that. Obviously, you lose your head coach in Sean Payton, who is a mastermind, but there's a lot of continuity as far as bringing Dennis Allen up from a a promotion. He's been on the team for a while as a coach. Um, You keep the offensive coordinator kind of in place, so there's a lot of, of things that aren't changing outside of that. You're also getting back Michael Thomas. Huge, huge addition into the offense. This wide receiver room last year, was one of the worst in the league. Like I remember multiple times, like 
in my head being like, is Traquan Smith even good? I know I should play him on the showdown slate, but is, is should I even good. do this? <laughs> and he's not. So you're getting Michael Thomas presumably back into the lineup. And I know there's a lot of kind of what's the motivation level, what's the relationship with the team like, but let's just assume he plays and he's motivated. I mean, getting him back is massive. Then you talk about, well, who are they mocking? You know, who are the mock drafts looking at with the Saints? They're often with one of these stud wide receivers, whether it's Alave or Jamison Williams or Drake London or whoever, you know, falls there. If they get that upgraded and they, let's say, take a tackle and they don't go quarterback, just like with the Giants, you're getting two pieces that are going to contribute right away in this season. Look at that division. NFC South projects to be quite awful with Carolina uh, and obviously the uh, the Falcons, Kyle. Spoiler alert, are not going to be good. What's yeah, your deal, Kyle's man? Give, Kyle's giving me a face like, how dare you say that? Um so you look at that and you say, okay, let's see what happens if they take these two. You know, their over under is eight. Eight wins seems somewhat efficient. It was first at seven and a half. It got bet up to eight. It's one minus one ten on both sides. Odds to make the playoffs. Yes is plus one sixty. No is minus two hundred to win the division, plus three fifty. It's just hard to see that, you know, truthfully, unless Tom Brady gets injured, which we're not accounting for. I don't think that's possible, truthfully. But I think these alternative markets like the over eight, you know, the yes to make the playoffs at plus 160, I think is really interesting just because of how bad the NFC truly is. If this team goes again nine and eight or uh, 10 and seven and they sneak in as a wild card, like that seems pretty enticing to me. If you get at least replacement level play, like you said, from Jameis Winston again, coming off the ACL. The final point here that I do want to talk about is their offensive line last year for the Saints. I think a lot of people... When you ask, you know, general folks like, hey, who who has a good offensive line in of football? People usually will include the Saints in that conversation. But last year, what they dealt with with injury, I didn't realize how bad it was, was truly the worst. And when I mean the worst, it was the worst in fantasy fo- in, in football in the NFL. You look at uh, the percentage of time their starting five from week one played together was about 16%. And per Rich Rebar on Twitter, dead last in football because they dealt with injuries to all their guys, Tron Armstead, Ryan Ramchek, Eric McCoy, all those guys dealt with injury at some point in the season. And they still kind of managed to keep it together and get uh, above 500. So I think at eight wins, if they take two win now pieces in the draft, I would be pretty interested in their over. What are your thoughts on that, Kyle? Their offensive line, they're, they're like the Patriots where they've just for years just had tackles and guards that they've gotten in the draft, they developed, and it just worked out every single time. I think they are hitting the end of that. So, yeah, I, it's crazy to think what you mentioned. Like, they had 13 different starting offensive linemen last year. Like, 13 different guys that started an actual game for them. And you saw you saw Alvin Kamara actually lose a lot of his red zone prowess that he had the year before. I think the bet of them, if you're saying they're going to go above eight wins, then at plus 160 to make the playoffs, I think that's a fine bet to make at this point. I think the NFC is ripe for them to take. Their schedule, though, I will say, is not one of my favorites. All right, it's a second place schedule. You know, some of their road games are not gimmies at all. I mean, the Eagles, they play the play your Eagles. Uh, we have Steelers, we have 49ers, we have the Browns, the Cardinals. I mean, that's a pretty tough road schedule. And then there's just not as many gimmies other than the Falcons on their schedule and the Panthers. So. I would say the line is efficient when it moved up from seven and a half to eight. In my initial projections, it was at eight point two five, which is not enough for me to say you have to do it. I mean, there's a there's a push there if you want that. I think this team is is good enough to be in the playoffs, though. It just matters how they want to use this, and I, I think them picking a quarterback here would be a mistake. I think that they've basically invested and said, "Hey, we're going to have a bridge here uh, with Dalton and Winston." And, hey, we're not going to do this experiment anymore with Taysom Hill. So I think the Saints are good enough. And right now, I think plus 160, I would take that. Yeah, I think if you're going to play either of these two, whether it's the win total or to make the playoffs, to me, it's to make the playoffs just because at plus 160, it's pretty good odds. I think my approach here is I'm going to hold on this until the NFL draft happens and then pounce right away because depending on what they do in in year one or what they do with their first pick, I should say, tells us their approach to the players they take. If they take a quarterback, eh, that doesn't help the team very much this year, so I would probably stay away. But if they pass on quarterback and take two players that can contribute, like a tackle, like a wide receiver, 
then um then yeah, I think to make the playoffs at plus one sixty is pretty interesting. I think that yeah, sixteen and nineteen are just prime spots for a wide receiver to get some offensive line help. I know Trevor Penning has been a player that's been uh mocked there a lot, Northern Iowa offensive tackle. So there's lots of different spots for them to contribute in year one. And yeah, this team, you remember what they did in week one against the Packers, just completely blew them out. They were five and two with Jameis Winston when things fell apart. So yeah, I think the Saints are a team that maybe people aren't talking about or even thinking about, but they were without Michael Thomas. I think that they can get above 500 again. So yeah, it's a good spot. I want to give two final bonus off the wall scenarios before we get into our predictions. What if we get a spot where somebody unexpected takes a quarterback at the end of round one? This is a team that's thinking for the future and kind of like how the Packers did with Jordan Love. It's not going to actually help their team with their pick. And so I'm going to give three teams here, Tennessee, Tampa Bay, and Arizona. Thoughts? The Arizona one, I can't really see unless this Kyler Murray stuff is real, which I don't think it is as far as, you know, right now he he wants a new contract. They keep saying they're going to talk about it and it just hasn't happened yet, but I can't see them moving on from Kyler personally, unless they get a haul for him, which I don't think is possible at this point in the market. Um, I I can't see it. Tampa Bay absolutely could see it. Obviously we know this is Tom's likely last year. I mean, who knows this guy could play forever, but this guy's such a tease. We think this is his last year, so it would make a ton of sense. And then, yeah, Tennessee as well. Um, I know Ryan Tannehill is there for a few more years, but it's not like he's it's not like he's a top ten quarterback in the NFL. You know that certainly you could look for a higher ceiling, possibly, or someone that you just want to sit for a couple of years and then take over when he's uh, he's on his way out. Yeah, he can be cut this next year, and I think we've seen the peak Ryan Tannehill in terms of efficiency. I think if you faded him this past year, then I mean you went out like he had one game at the very end of the year where he was any anything close to being serviceable. And you and I, it's crazy. You and I faded the Titans in terms of like their fantasy weapons. And we played some Derrick Henry and best ball. But I think for the most part, we were like, hey, this team is going to regress. And fantasy wise, you didn't get that right from Tannehill, from Brown, from Henry. Definitely not the Ferk daddy. You didn't get any of those. And yet they ended up having the best record in the AFC. That's that's just so much variance that it's so frustrating when you make your calls and everything else. You're like, Everything stats wise worked out for us except for the wins. Also, not much from Julio. Sad times. Oh, that it was it's painful to see your heroes just slowly, slowly, slowly bleed out like this. It's just he's he's Julio. He's one of the best. All right, I'm gonna give one more scenario. And this one's I don't know if it's gonna happen, but I've seen some chatter. What if no quarterback goes in the first round, which hasn't happened since nineteen ninety six. But Lions at two, we would say, hey, they don't, they don't have to take a quarterback here. We would say they're not going to. That's what our betting thing is. What if the Panthers trade back like their GM had done last year and say, we don't need a quarterback here, all right? And then other than the Steelers, there is no team that says they have to take a quarterback, in, your, in my opinion. That's true. There is no team that says they have to. However, I'd be shocked if at least one didn't go. In the first round, even if in a, in a scenario where they just keep falling and falling and falling, like someone in the early round two or back of the first is like, hey, we never thought we would have a chance at Malik Willis. Let's go get him kind of thing. So I would be totally shocked if he didn't, if at least one of them didn't. But um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible, especially in this draft class. Yeah. The thing that works against this scenario, like I said, it hasn't happened in a long time, is the economics of how teams build. You know, it's like you want five years with this quarterback on a rookie deal, and you're going to get that if they're a first round pick. So somebody sliding like we used to see with Drew Brees way back in the day, right? They traded that pick. The Falcons got Michael Vick. They got Ladanian Thompson, and then they picked Drew Brees at the top of the second round. That's not really how it works anymore. So I think based on needs of all the years it could happen, this is the year. Not great prospects, and then really not that many teams that need it. But if we're not seeing that, let's just say everybody's passing. There's going to be a team that trades up and takes their shot at a Desmond Ritter or a Kenny Pickett or Malik Willis at the end of the, the first round. So that's what I'm most interested is who trades up for this quarterback. And could it be a team like we mentioned? Like, okay, hey, this quarterback's sitting around. When Lamar Jackson went in the 32nd pick that year, 
Baltimore traded up. They had Joe Flacco, and they traded up to get Lamar Jackson, which was on nobody else's boards. Yeah. And let's also give a quick shout out to your boy, Paxton Lynch, who <laughs> Not he was my a first boy. round. He was a first round quarterback. He was Kyle's one oh one in that year, if I recall correctly. And uh he made his return to the football field this weekend. Did you see his miraculous interception that he threw? And his and his fumble. He is- It was the worst pass I have seen in quite a th- remember last last week on the show, my uh, my boulder cold? I told you the football was going to be horrendous this past weekend. Shout out to the USFL, it was back, but it was not pretty. And Paxton Lynch was the epicenter of that. I know Paxton doesn't listen to this show, and I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine. But if you know Paxton, your friend, tell him this. Dude, it's probably time for a career change. And that's okay. <laughs> that's totally okay. It's actually better to have some self-awareness and know that it's time to move on. And if if your next thing is you can dress up as a really tall pirate, you can do it, Paxton. So let's get into our bold or cold predictions. Ridiculously bold predictions. All right. Bold or cold. So I'm kind of proud of myself for this take that I'm about to give <laughs> because of how it fits into this segment. We're talking bold or cold. I want to talk to you about coffee, Kyle. All right. You can get a bold roast. You can get coffee, uh, iced coffee, cold, you know, obviously. So it fits. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, my take is that your day should be starting with a hot coffee, even in the summer months when it's at where you are, 100 degrees, or where I am, 85 degrees, you're still enjoying a nice cup of hot coffee to start your day. This is not to say that cold or iced coffee or cold brew does not have its place in the coffee world because I still enjoy both. But to me, your day can't get started with an iced coffee. It's got to be hot right out of the pot. It's got to be steaming. Even when it's it's hot outside, it's the place you got to go. And you're and you're you're saying what I heard was Folgers or Maxwell House. Is that what you're saying? I mean, it can be whatever you prefer. It doesn't have to be, but if you want to sing the jingle in the morning, that's fine. I just we just lost them as a sponsor. Both of those. <laughs> both <were> like, uh, <laughs> then yeah, definitely not them. <laughs> so I have a cup of coffee with my wife every single morning of my life, and most of it is just us not even talking to each other. It's just you know just sitting there. So um, you're a morning guy. I know that about you. You you like to wake up. Uh, you do like you do sip over coffee. Like sometimes you do this actual show, like your prep, you're like nice cup of coffee. You're not really that used to the heat. That's the thing. Like you don't really know you're, you're like a child. You don't even know you're naive. (laughs) I'm going to say you believe this. You better believe this, right? I mean, it depends on what you're referencing as far as being used to the heat. Am I used to your new heat out there in Arizona? No, I would certainly not be able to do that. But, um, you know, we have some hot, especially in Vermont, like hot days that you wouldn't be you know, expecting it. But like late July, early August, it gets t- close to 90, which once you're above like 85, I mean, it's hot no matter what. So I have experienced some of this, Kyle. Don't get me wrong. But um, but yeah, I think this is the way to go. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to be a psycho and drink it outside on the deck when it's like 80 degrees or something but it just to me signals the start of the day and i love that i also am a two cup of coffee guy so in the summer months i'm a big fan of hot coffee in the morning ice in the afternoon you get both it's a it's a very nice experience okay okay so what i what i heard you say is you need to start hot though oh yeah yeah no i get get that out of here if you're getting your iced coffee like i want i don't even care if it's super nice coffee my first cup um, and then depending on the days, if I get my second, but just, just give me a hot cup of coffee, uh, sit next to my wife who doesn't want to talk to me. She's just, she's just like, I want to read. Sounds great. It's fine. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give mine my hot take. This is hot. First off, this is just a fact. I like a good nap. Okay. I want to start off by saying I like a really good nap on Saturday. This is what my family does. This is, this is true. My family institutes a Sabbath where everyone has to take a nap after lunch on a Saturday. Everyone, like whole family, like all in separate rooms. Like I don't even want to take a nap near my wife. I want to go find a spot by myself. Everyone has to take a nap. But here's my take. I'm flying this week to Atlanta for my sister's wedding. And while some people have a hard time with this, 
One of my favorite places to take a nap is on an airplane. The sound, the lights are dimmed. I have my neck pillow. I have my earplugs. <laughs> I'm good to go. I can sleep, just, just to be honest, I can sleep the entire plane ride if you let me. If my kids let me, I would. I would pay, and I guess I guess I am paying for a nap at 35,000 feet in the air once a week. I would do it, and it would bring me so much happiness. I have two things to say. One, I am picturing you with your neck pillow on, and it is quite funny. <laughs> Noise-canceling headphones, neck pillow on. Do you do you have the uh, the little eye covers, whatever those are called, the sleep mask? No, I, I don't have that. Okay, you're not like that. Um, the second thing I have to say is, do you does your family all take a nap at the exact same time on Saturdays? Yes, we do. Okay, and that's that's actually true. That's actually true. Yes. Okay, that is impressive. Wow. As far as this take about the airplane and being able to sleep. I think I've met like three people in my life who actually enjoy sleeping on an airplane. So I guess you'd be number four. I don't believe that this is accurate. I don't dang, think you can sleep that well on a plane. Dang it. Dang it. Dang it. Yes. Dang it. Okay. Uh, no, I can't sleep on an airplane at all. There's way too much going on. My kids want something every five seconds. It is not comfortable. I can't knock out. I can't even do it while I'm watching a movie. It is so frustrating that I want to go to sleep more than anything else on a you know four-hour plane ride. And I can't do it at all, which is crazy because Jason Moore is one of the best people in the world at falling asleep all the time. doesn't really matter, but specifically on a plane. Like he, he says it's one of his top places to fall asleep. I can't do it. I don't want to miss out on the snacks. I don't want to miss out on the beverage cart. And so I have anxiety of falling asleep and missing that. So yeah, going to sleep. I love taking naps. I really wish I could do it every single day. And maybe I will when I'm old. I'm sleeping, but every day na- nap on a plane is, uh, it's just not something that I have in my repertoire. Maybe I need to work on it. Maybe in my forties, I'm only about to be 35. Maybe that's like in your forties kind of thing. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Ask Jason when he started, because, um, now I'm confirmed that that's, that's a red flag on Jason that he likes sleeping on a plane. I have many questions for that man. You know, maybe it's one of those things that I just need to change my wardrobe. Like if I just have some nice pleated khakis, Get me some New Balance. You, uh, you know, tuck in. Get the in cell like, phone clip. Yeah. For the belt. I just have maybe a visor. I, there's, oh, yeah. there's, there's so many possibilities that maybe that's what's hindering me. Me and my, uh, my really cool getup is actually causing me not to sleep so well. But you can give us some of your thoughts about our Boulder Cold takes. We'll give some more as the season goes on. And as we get closer to the NFL draft, which next week we will get to give our reactions for round one. It's going to be super, super great. I'm pretty stoked about actually finding out who the Falcons screw up picking. It'll be great, man. I can't wait. Also, the Eagles. They're going to screw up the wide receiver that they take for sure. But um, let's go Jamison Williams top five. Let's go top ten. I'm excited for next week's show, Kyle, because you and I are going to be enjoying enjoying a nice warm cup of coffee the morning after the NFL draft. Let's go. We'll see you guys next Friday. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at www.thefantasyfootballers.com.